In this session, I'd like to talk about architecture diagrams in Structure 101 and how they help you to bridge the gap between how your code base is structured and how it should be structured. There are three basic to this session. In the first, I'd like to talk in pretty abstract terms about the semantics of diagrams, how we use them to define rules about which components are allowed to use which other components. In the second section, I'll talk a bit about patterns. Patterns are the mechanism by which we associate the cells or components in our architecture diagrams with actual real code in the code base. And finally, I'd like to show you how Structure 101 makes your life easier by creating diagrams from existing code. And this takes all kind of legwork out of creating cells and assigning patterns. OK, let's get going. Let's create a new diagram. And we'll select the option to start with an empty diagram. And then I'm going to create some cells. I'm going to create four cells. And I'm going to give them some names. First one I'm going to call A. Second one I'm going to call B. Third one I'm going to call, you can guess it, I think, C. And we'll finish with D. Now, the basic metaphor uh, for architecture diagrams is like a brick wall in that it's okay for bricks and a wall to depend on bricks lower down, but if you try to depend on bricks to the side or above you, your brick wall will probably fall down. And so we'd avoid that. So by default in an architecture diagram, any cell can depend on a cell lower than it in the layering. Now this means at the moment, A is allowed to use B, C, or D, B is allowed to use C or D, and C is allowed to use D. No other dependencies are allowed. Now, sometimes we might want to switch on strict layering, switch it on here. This changes the semantics such that we're only allowed, any cell is only allowed to depend on cells one layer down, immediately below it in the layering. So with strict layering switched on, I've changed these rules to say that A is allowed to use B, B is allowed to use C, C is allowed to use D, no other dependencies are allowed. I'll switch that off. Now we can use drag and drop on individual cells to change their location, to modify the layering, and so express our rules differently. By dragging and dropping D up to this location, I've changed the rules here to say that A is allowed to use B, C, or D. B is allowed to use C or D. No other dependencies are allowed. You can also drag and drop cells inside other cells to represent composition. We'll come to a little more on that later. In a lot of cases, I can capture generalizations quite well with the layering in the diagram, but I may have some exceptions to those generalizations. If I want to express those, I do so using overrides. So at the moment, D is not allowed to use A. Let's say I'm happy with the diagram. Otherwise, I might right click, choose Create Override, click on the A cell, and get a nice green arrow telling me that despite the layering, D is actually allowed to use A. Undo that to get rid of it. Same the other way around, let's create an override from A to D. Despite the layering now, A is not allowed to use D. That comes up as a red arrow. Undo that to get rid of it. Now, supposing I wanted to move A to the side of all of B, C, and D, I can't do that at the moment. I can move it to here or here, um, but I can't move it to the side of all. If I want to achieve that result, I'm going to select all of these guys, say wrap selected. Now I can move A down to the side. So in this diagram, I'm now saying that B is allowed to use C or D. Um, no other dependency is allowed. Let's move him back up top. Visibility. <coughs> Select the D cell. By default, all the cells in the diagram have public visibility. I can change this to private visibility, and I get my little padlock appearing here. This is analogous to declaring method in a class, for example, as private. So the container can use it, all the siblings can use it, nobody else can. So in this case now, I'm saying that B is allowed to use D still because they exist inside the same container. A is no longer allowed to use D here because D is private. Note that A would still be allowed to use C. As the standard. Let's undo that to get rid of it. Oh. Let's see the first topic. So let's unwrap this cell. Don't need that wrapper anymore. So I've covered 
pretty much all of the ways that I can influence the rules of a diagram by dragging and dropping cells to appropriate locations, uh, using wrapper cells where necessary, maybe setting visibility, um, the ability to define layering as strict or not strict, and defining overrides where I want to express exceptions to the general rules conveyed by the diagram. Okay, now I'd like to show you how we can bring this diagram to life, so to speak, by associating cells with items in the code base. And the way we do this is by defining patterns for the cell. So I'm going to define a pattern now for uh, the A cell. And I'm going to give it a pattern of com.foo class 1. Now, an interesting thing just happened that this class icon popped up. And that's because Structure 101, looking at this pattern, which contains no wildcards, says, hmm, looks as though that cell must map to a single class. Let's try changing the pattern a bit. Com.foo to question mark. Again, this icon here has changed, but it's now changed to a leaf package because this pattern corresponds to any class which happens to be located in the leaf package com.foo. Change it again, com.foo to star. Again, the icon changes. This pattern will map to any class in the subsystem com.foo. So that could be in the package com.foo or the package com.foo.banana, apple. I can define more interesting patterns. Let's try com.foo.apple star, com.foo banana stuff. The bundles, the sorry, the icon has changed here to this bundle icon. That's because this cell no longer maps to a single um, component class or package in the physical hierarchy. It's a bundle of stuff, a mix. So in this case, it maps to any class in the package com.foo, which happens to start with apple or with banana. This uh, comma, by the way, is an implicit or. So if, any, if either of these patterns match, then the corresponding code item will be associated with the A cell. Let's try one more pattern here. Come, sorry. Star dot W star. So this is any class in any package whose name happens to start with a W. And when I run this now, an interesting thing happens, and then I get a bunch of um, items appearing in this viewer down bottom left. These are items directly associated with the A cell. If we have a look to see well, what code items are they, we'll find that all of these, these are all the classes that start with the letter W. These have now been associated with the A cell. Now, up to now, I've been working with an option switched off here, one of the default options, so I can switch it back on again now, grey out our unassociated cells. And when I switch that on again, I note that A uh, is easily visible, but the B, C, and D cells are all greyed out. This is because those cells aren't live. They don't map to any items in the code base. Um, now, sometimes this is, a, this is a perfectly legitimate scenario, by the way. It could be if, in forward engineering um, scenarios where you want to, in advance, say, yep, here I've got some chunk of code which is going to fit into the diagram. I haven't written the code yet, but I can already define where it belongs. In this case, all of these cells are actually pretty meaningless. I have leaf cells on the diagram which are not associated with any code in the code base. So let's try doing another association. And we'll do this one. Um, and say all of the classes whose name happens to start with a Z, we're going to associate with the B cell. We switch that on, and down here again we see a bunch of classes appearing, all the classes who start with a Z. Let's do the same now for the C cell, and we'll give that a pattern of any class that starts with an A. And another interesting thing has just happened now. In addition to populating this cell, um, this cell, with some classes from the code base, this is ant by the way, we've also got a violation that's popped up. This is to say that there is stuff associated with the C cell, C cell, which is using stuff associated with B cell, and it's not supposed to. Our layering diagram says that the stuff in C is not supposed to use B. 
And so this is shown to us as a violation. So by the way, we get a, a similar result or effect if we change the layering now and move B above A, because as it happens, there is stuff associated with the A cell that's using stuff associated with the B cell, and according to our layering diagram, it shouldn't. Now, obviously, this is all a slightly obscure example in terms of the patterns I'm using, but the basic principle is that architecture diagrams define rules in a visual way, and through the patterns, we map the cells from the diagram to actual code in the code base and highlight the problem areas, the, the cases where there are dependencies going in the wrong direction, dependencies that aren't allowed in the according to the semantics of the architecture diagram, we display those as violations. Now, very, very briefly, actually an architecture diagram inside the client is really not very different at all to any dependency graph that we'd see, for instance, in the composition or slice perspective, that you have a bunch of items in the graph and dependencies between them. By default, we only show the violations, but there are various possibilities or options in the options menu to say, actually show all dependencies or just show dependencies on selected or on mouse over or whatever, in which case we'll be able to see all the interactions between the cells. And by default, those, those uh, that's switched on. Okay, we've seen how we can create diagrams from scratch. In practice, most of the time, it's, it's a lot easier and quicker to let Structure 101 create the diagrams for you and then maybe tweak them afterwards. So I'd like to show you a bit of that now. Uh, start off here. And this time I'm going to say, create me a new diagram based on the existing code. I'm going to pick the org subsystem and say, finish. And it's created me at this level of breakout now, one level down. So I've got three subsystems, and these are the relationships between them. Note that Structure 101 does its best based on the existing dependency structure in the code to infer the correct layering. So in this case, it's decided that the Apache cell is on the top, and these other two ones beside each other, lower down. I'm going to switch another of my options on now uh, that was switched off previously, called Show Expand Collapse Buttons. So at this stage, I might choose to expand one of these. And now I can, I've pulled into this diagram on the fly the next level of breakout. I'll do a similar thing again now, but in a slightly different way. Create me a new diagram based on the code, but this time I'm going to say go down to a depth of two from this start point. And this gives me this diagram. This is in effect the equivalent of expanding all three of those cells in the previous diagram uh, one by one. Note that in this case, the, there is a violation, so Structure 1 normal one did its best, but there's a, a backward dependency somewhere in the code between Xerxes and XML serialized. That might be something I want to look at. I might want to explicitly allow it or whatever. Um, whenever Structure 101 is creating the diagrams for me, it's I'll just pick the event cell here. It's automatically creating all these cells, deciding where they go in the layering as best it can, and giving them appropriate names and patterns. Let's make that a bit wider. So this particular pattern here is our question mark at the end, so this, this cell corresponds to the events package. Now, I guess there's one more subtlety I'd like to mention at the end here around patterns that's important to understand. And I'm going to illustrate this with the views package, which is very small. It contains just, see over here, there are just two cells associated with this package, or sorry, with this cell in the diagram. And those are the interfaces, document view, and abstract view. Now I can pull in more stuff into the diagram from this viewer by drag and drop. So I'm going to do that now. I've created a new cell in the diagram. It's got a name of document view, so a bit more width here, a name of document view, and a pattern of org W3C DOM views document view. And we notice here from this viewer bottom left that the document view interface is now associated with this cell. If I select the views um, cell, document view is no longer associated with it. So what's happened here is that when it becomes time for Structure 101 to say, OK, I have a, an interface document view in the code base, which cell in the diagram shall I associate it with? There's actually a number of candidates that have patterns that um, would accept it. So this pattern is acceptable. Um, as is the views one, and by the way, so is this one up here, the W3C DOM. However, this cell will win because its pattern is the most specific. And this allows me to do some interesting things with diagrams in that I can pull 
individual classes or packages or subsystems or whatever out of where they belong in the physical code and move them around to somewhere else. So for example, I could now move this into events. And what I've done there is simulated a refactoring. I've simulated actually taking a class out of one package and moving it into another. And the very last thing I would mention here is that if we look at the events package and say the items directly associated with events, I won't actually see document view anywhere because it's not directly associated with the cell. To understand that, I have to expand the cell and see that inside events, I now have this document view cell. Um, and this interface is directly associated with that cell, but it's also indirectly associated with the parent cell. And this understanding the mapping through patterns between the code and the cells in the diagram, this is really where this viewer comes in. It allows me to understand exactly with which cell are uh, code base items directly or indirectly associated. And for example, I can also say which items have I explicitly excluded by the excludes pattern up here. And finally, I can also say, well, what cells are not in the diagram at the moment? So there's a, in this case, there's a whole bunch of code in the code base, which is untouched by this diagram. Finally, finally, should briefly mention that I can also create architecture diagrams from dependency graphs that I see in the composition or slice perspectives. Let's look at that very briefly. Um, here's a dependency graph I'm looking at at the moment. I might say that's an interesting candidate for an architecture diagram. Create one, okay, and I got a new diagram this way. So there's another um, mechanism by which I can create new diagrams. Oh, let Structure 101 create new diagrams for me. Right, um, I think that's enough for now. Thanks a lot for listening.